Hello, my miraculous friend, and welcome to another episode of the Magnify Your Miracles podcast. This is Reverend Francis Faden, and I'm so grateful that we get to spend this time helping you magnify your miracles. Today, we're going to be talking to a miraculous woman, somebody who, if you've been a fan of the podcast, you've seen her before. This is actually her fourth time here as a guest and her beautiful books. And last week we were able to talk about the beautiful book that she's written that is out that I highly, highly recommend that you get if you don't have it yet called Take Back the Magic. But before we get into all the great stuff and I introduce you to Perdita, let's take a few deep breaths together, get ourselves grounded and centered. And just breathing in the energy of expansion and breathing out anything that you no longer need. And if you are driving, please keep your eyes on the road, but you can always bring your awareness to your breath. And knowing that whatever it is that you need to hear today to help you to magnify your miracles is exactly what you're going to be hearing. Let's take one more deep breath together in gratitude. And we can begin. All right, my friend. Well, thank you once again for being here. And, you know, when you find good people, you just really want to hang out with good people. And I'm so grateful to have this podcast where I'm allowed to invite people that have touched me and whose work blesses the world. And my friend Perdita Finn is one of those people, and I highly encourage you to go back through my catalog of episodes and listen to every one where she's been here <laughs> because they're so good, and you could just live in that energy forever. But I'm going to introduce you formally. Perdita Finn is the co-founder with her husband, Clark Strand, of the non-denominational international fellowship, The Way of the Rose, which inspired their book, The Way of the Rose, The Radical Path of the Divine Feminine Hidden in the Rosary. In addition to extensive study with Zen masters, priests, rabbis, shamans, and healers, she apprenticed with the psychic Susan Saxman, with whom she wrote uh, The Reluctant Psychic. Finn now teaches popular workshops on getting to know the dead in which participants are empowered to activate the magic in their own lives with the help of their ancestors. And she lives with her family in the moss-filled shadows of the Catskill Mountains. Yay, Perdita, welcome. Welcome to you, Francis. It's a delight to be here. And uh, oh, there's so much to talk about as you know. So much to talk about. Well, I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy. Your publicist sent me an advanced copy of Take Back the Magic Conversations with the Unseen World. And I have to tell you the magic that happened with this. So is it okay to share how this book showed up in my life? Please, please do. Because you are an agent for the divine, in my opinion, <laughs> for this magic. So we all are, but <laughs> well, you really are like a what Mother Mary calls a lighthouse. You're really sending out this this message in a powerful way. So you know, I took your course last year. Remember, you were on the on the podcast last year. I had taken your course on Take Back the Magic, helping me connect with the ancestors, went through that whole process. Amazing process, which I highly recommend everybody take as many courses with you as they possibly can. And then kind of tucked it away like, okay, you know, noticed things that were happening and all of that. And then we scheduled this podcast episode and pot, we wanted to do the interview and we're picking the dates to do it and all of that. And I knew I was going to be getting the advanced copy and unbeknownst to me, uh, my sister-in-law who had been sick, my sister-in-law was in the way of the rose. She was what you call a rosebud, somebody who showed up and prayed with everybody and um, was really involved. And my sister-in-law had been sick for the last four and a half years, but the last two years she was really involved in way of the rose. And I found out that she passed on um, she passed on July 21st. I didn't find out until that Monday. And an hour after I heard, I opened the door and there's your book. And I was like, I've been waiting for this book for <laughs> like I've been waiting for this book for a couple of weeks. And I was like, oh, this is the medicine I need because I was heartbroken. You know, I, I didn't get to see her or any of that. And I was really heartbroken. And I felt like it was a sign from you, from the divine, reminding me 
that I can have this ongoing relationship, even if I didn't get a chance to say goodbye formally and all of that. And I picked up your book and I started reading it and I was reminded of everything that you taught, which is people don't go anywhere. You know, nobody goes anywhere. Everybody's right there. And so I, I was, I was talking to my, my sister-in-law, her name was Tina. And I was talking to her and I was like, all right, Tina, because she she left a little bit of a mess behind. And I remember you said, all, you know, Francis, we all leave a mess behind. <laughs> the way exactly. <laughs> and I try remember, not to, but, you know, <laughs> exactly. And I remember you said, like, you can ask them to clean it up. So I was like, I'm asking you to help clean this up. And so I had been, you know, kind of praying and, and chatting with her. And I'm like, you know, I love you. Everything's fine. But like, we could really use your help to clean up some of these things. And three days later, I was going to our local frozen yogurt place or whatever it was. And I did a U-turn on the street. And as I was making this U-turn, the wall was an advertisement. It was this huge advertisement for either perfume or makeup or something like that. And it had nine women's faces. And underneath of it, it just said, Christina, Christina, Christina. And that was her name, Christina. Oh, and I was I'm like, chills head to toe. I'm totally having chills even now when I'm saying it. And I'm just like, Tina, I was like, she said hi to me. She said hi to me. And all my grief just like washed off of me. And I was like, she's okay. She's letting me know she's on it. And within 24 hours, I found out that the thing that I was so concerned about with stuff that she had left behind, that was kind of the mess. It wasn't a mess. It was handled. It was all handled. So that's my introduce introduction and my story of only in a small tiny bit of what I've experienced since working with you and the comfort that I've had knowing that when people cross over, it ain't over, you know, and I knew that from being raised Catholic, but the way you teach it is really, really different for me, makes it very accessible. And I really think Perdita, everybody needs this book. Everybody needs to know what you're teaching. So I wanted to share that story with you. Well, thank you. And if it's all right with you, because Tina was a very uh, devoted member of our Way of the Rose community, she came, you know, she came very vulnerably to a lot of circles and was praying for a miracle. And, you know, this is a question I want to talk about with you, because I think it's really interesting is what happens when you it seems like you don't get your miracle? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that was really powerful about Tina, I'll never forget, there was this moment when her doctor had told her the treatments weren't going to work anymore. Mm. Then she got accepted into an NIH study. Right. And it looked like suddenly, oh my gosh, this is it. She's going to get this special treatment. She's going to get better. They're going. Her numbers were good. And for six months, it looked like this was the answer. You, she was going to get her miracle. And it didn't work. And... And so the question, the mystery is, were her prayers answered or not? Mm -hmm. And it's a really powerful moment. It's a very intense moment. You know, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, there's no, no one gets out. I always say we all get an A in death. You know, we all do it. We all <laughs> do it perfectly. Right. We don't, nobody fails at it, right? Like, right. And everything dies, trees dies, mountain dies, rivers dies, planets die, stars and suns die, everything dies. Mm -hmm. But the thing we've also forgotten is everything comes back. Mm -hmm. And nature teaches us that everything comes back. And what happens when we come back if we knew that everything comes back and nothing went anywhere? You know, sometimes I was talking to some people who knew Tina and I said, you know, what happens when there's a little girl or a little boy who's born and people look, well, that kid's blessed. That kid's got the best health. That kid never gets sick. You know what I mean? We don't know how a prayer is answered. We don't know what prayers we arrive with already answered when we were born into this life. So and, true. And, and, and. Every moment is a miracle in an answered prayer. You know, sometimes I think about my children. I think, how long have I been praying to be reunited with them? Yeah. How long have I been praying? Sometimes I think, you know, my daughter suffers from 
a terrible illness. And I think I've been praying for it to be healed, not just in this lifetime, but for many lifetimes. Mm -hmm. It feels like an old, old prayer. And I think sometimes there are life, you know, sometimes we carry a prayer with us lifetime upon lifetime upon lifetime. Sometimes we arrive into a life and you look at somebody and think, oh my God, that person's hopelessly charmed. But we don't know what the lifetimes are that lie behind them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what is the miracle? You know, that that's the thing. It's like, what is the miracle? And given, you know, given what I knew of Tina and her, her path to be free of that fear, in my opinion, I think that was the miracle, you know, and who knows what's going to happen. Who knows I thought what's it was, happen. you know, I don't know what her last days were like, and you never know what someone's yeah. internal experience is. But I did over the course of a couple of years, watch her go from a kind of desperate, fe mm -hmm. fear-filled, you know, anxious to a very receptive, very vulnerable faith. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, I have to say, I wrote her, I don't know if she ever got it, but one of the last letters I wrote her said that she had been an inspiration to me in faith. Mm because it sometimes seems to me that all of life comes down to that choice between fear and faith mm -hmm. or fear and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll share with you too, that I went to um, a healer um, probably a, a week or so after Tina had passed and I wasn't trying to get a message from her, but in the, you know, after working on me for like 45 minutes, this person said to me, I think your sister-in-law's here. And I said, Tina's here. She's like, yes, yeah, she's here. And she's just laughing and laughing. And I knew it's like, Tina had such a great sense of humor. She's probably cracking up because here I am with this like shaman. that's like got this New Jersey Jewish accent, you know, with all the, all, and she would have thought that was hysterical. And I was like, if she's on the other side laughing, in my opinion, I think she got her miracle. I think she got her miracle. Well, I think we all get our miracle. And I think one of the yeah. things when we die, you know, is that one of the reasons I like to be in relationship with the dead is I realize that when I die, there is going to be the inevitable departure with those people on this side of the veil that will be painful. I mean, gosh, I want to be with the people I love for a long time. Yeah. And yet there are going to be so many people on the other side. Yeah. With whom reunited. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things I think is so important about your work and about this book is, like you said, we're not only are we all going to cross over, we're all going to die, um, but we're all going to know somebody, you know, not everyone's going to have an apparition of Mother Mary. Not everybody's going to see an angel. Not everyone's going to have, you know, those kinds of things but everybody has somebody on the other side. Everybody is going to have somebody, even if it's your cat or whatever. And that's why I think this is so important because I feel like your book is like a manual of like, how do we, how do we metabolize that? How do we, how do we live when we have this? And you do such a beautiful job explaining your relationship with your father and what it was like and what it's like now. Would you tell us a little bit about that, that journey? Or sure. So my father was an angry Irish ex-Catholic atheist. And as my husband often said, he believed in hell, but not heaven. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he was convinced he was damned to hell because he didn't, you know what I mean? Like, because yeah. he wasn't a good Catholic boy anymore. Yeah. Even yeah. though he didn't believe, you know, I mean, oh my gosh. And, and like many people, men of his generation, he was actually a pretty good guy in public. He was a doctor. He was a doctor who really did take care of people and really, and animals. He once rushed a cat to the emergency room, mm -hmm. and, you know, but at home, the stress of his job, the stresses of his life, he was, he was a bit of a monster, mm -hmm. you know, he was an angry and patient, sometimes frightening person who had a really hard time expressing his love. Mm-hmm. You know, I once said, you know, the worst thing he did is I almost, I felt like he almost loved me, you know, mm. in some ways it would have been better if he hadn't loved me, but you know, it was this kind of like, he felt like somebody, I think we, many of us had a relationships like this with 
somebody you can't make happy, somebody you can't please, somebody you can't feel. Yeah. yeah. And I think I often felt with my father, I came in this life with a lot of faith, Francis. And I think it's what I've carried with me lifetime to lifetime is that faith. In fact, you know, our house we had, not only did we not have any religious imagery or Bibles or any discussion of church, my father forbid my grandmother for taking us to church. So I'd never been inside a church, nothing. But as you'll read in the book, when I was a very little girl, my father used to come home and at two and three years old, I would be up praying on my knees mm -hmm. in front of an image of the Virgin Mary I'd found. And so my devotion was fierce. Mm -hmm. And it frightened my father. Mm. And he really stood against it. Mm. And he wanted to kind of convince me that the universe was a bleak and terrible, existentially lonely place. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was the energy I needed to find otherwise. Do you know what I mean? We don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes why do you get a parent like this? Oh, you know, mm -hmm. what, what is, but there was a way that having, you know, in this book, I write letters to my father because it was that conversation with his atheism that helped me find my foundation in my faith. And not that it changed anything when he was alive <laughs> because, you know, um, he died. It was, I was with him when he died. And on the one hand, it seemed very healing. Um, and then a few weeks after he died, I found out he'd cut me out of his will. Mm -hmm. Very painful. Not mm -hmm. because I wanted money or something, but because I wanted yeah. an expression of love. I, yeah. I, I didn't care what it was. I wanted, you know, yeah, give, give my green sock to Perdita because she loves <laughs> the color green. You know what I mean? Like yeah. any acknowledgement that I was his child and there was some reciprocity. And instead it was, you know, nothing. So that felt so painful but i have learned how to work with the dad and to work with my anger i was very angry francis i was yeah. angry at him for the ways he had squelched me the ways he'd made me frightened the ways he had made me disempowered me my life and and for this final denial of love mm. But I also needed him. And I'm going to tell you the first miracle he performed for me. Yeah, tell us. So as difficult as he was, he was highly competent as a doctor. He was so smart. He's the smartest guy in the room. He always was. And so, it, so to give you an example, like as an adolescent um, in the 70s, I had very painful periods. And in the seven, I guess, 1980s, 1978, my father got me to an expert on endometriosis in Boston who did laparoscopic surgery on me, which was, do you know how progressive that was? Yeah. Like, yeah. 1978. Like, absolutely. In 1978, women weren't having that done. Right. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. But he, he always knew the guy who was, you know, he right. found out what guy was researching painful periods and got me to him. And it wasn't like he was nice to me during this process, <laughs> but he. <laughs> there you know? Right, right. And, you know and I think you know on the way home after the surgery I was crying and he told me to shut up you know I mean I mean that's right. who he was right and, and, and he used to answer the phone forgive me is it all right if I swear I mean yep. this is not me this is my father so this was before cell phones and pagers and things and so the emergency room and the hospital would call our home phone all the time right night and day and my father's partner was a drunk. And if he was drunk, they'd call my father. So he was always on call. Mm. And we were in a small community. And so frequently the people who were sick were people he knew. Right, right. Very stressful. But he would answer the phone all through my childhood. As he'd pick up the phone, he'd go, Jesus H fucking Christ, who is it this time? <laughs> and it could be my friend it could be some like little eight-year-old girl calling me up to come play at her house and my father would answer the phone that way it was horrible <laughs> oh god it was so horrible. Okay. <laughs> just to give you some idea of who he was right but anyway after uh, less than a year after he died my daughter became very very sick hmm. and no one knew what was the matter she was really she was and she had 
headaches and stomach pains and her digestion didn't work anymore and rashes and joint pain and yeah. nope it was just constellation and we and I thought you said you find the best guy so we went to any number of best guys in New York City there were mm-hmm. guys and they all said the same thing which is oh this kid is sick there's inflammation throughout her body but we don't know what's causing it mm-hmm and she, meanwhile, she kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Yeah. And I was at my wit's end. Like we were going to, you know, Fifth Avenue special. We spent all our money, Francis. We took out a second mortgage on our house. We spent our yeah. life savings. We were trying to get her help. And she stopped going to school. We had to have tutors at home. Wow. She would lie in bed going, mommy, can you get me out of my body? Mm. And it was so upsetting. And one day I got word from another doctor, you know, all her numbers are off. We don't know what's causing it. We don't know why. And I was at the gym. I went to sort of work out at the gym just to kind of burn off steam. And on the way to the gym, I said to my father, God damn you for dying because I need you. (laughs) You know, my father would look at my daughter and he would have known who the guy was, right? Right, He would have known the person to get me to. Right. He wasn't there. And I was so mad at him anyway about everything. And I didn't have any, and you know, and then this time we were broke and oh, I was so mad at him. And I got to the gym and uh, this old woman who was my trainer at the gym, I'm the only person who has an 85 year old trainer. (laughs) want to be like when I get to that age yeah that's awesome (laughs) but she I burst out into tears and she said she said I hadn't wanted to say anything I know who you have to go to you have to go see my friend the psychic I thought oh no I hate Woodstock I hate (laughs) (laughs) I need a psychic I need a doctor right said no you got to go see the psychic. And she's the woman I wrote a book with, The Reluctant Psychic. And she was genuinely reluctant. She didn't advertise. You had to walk into her store. If she was there, if she felt like it, she might talk to you. Right. You never. <laughs> I didn't. Re- no, it's really like people. Yeah. T- people always come to me and say, like, how do we get an appointment with her? I said, you have to talk to the gods and you talk to your ancestors. And when the time is right, you'll drop by and she'll right. be there. Right. And, she'll- and that's how that's how it works. That's her appointment schedule. But I walked in this day and she was there. And the moment she looked at me, she said, oh, your kid is sick. Let's come into my room. Let's talk. Uh, uh, she pulled this tiny little one. She pulled me into her room. She said, she saw, th- she saw three things. The first thing she saw was she said, there's a woman beside you with a sword in her heart, her lady of sorrows. Mm-hmm. And then she said, oh, and your mother, she said, your mother used to live in your daughter's room. And I said, yes. She said, your mother's very beautiful. She looks like Elizabeth Taylor and she's got a white cat and then big Persian cat. I said, she does. <laughs> and she said, your mom holds your daughter every night. So mm. you can... That broke my heart. Mm. And then she said, oh, excuse me. I don't like to swear, but your father just showed up and he's saying, Jesus H. Fucking Christ. <laughs> what is it this time? <laughs> and that was it. Francis, that was the moment my life turned inside out. Yeah. I mean, I actually screamed because that was it. Like, no one knew that about my, you know what I mean? Like, right. Oh, dad's here. He's right, right here. Right. He's irascible. He's impossible. And he's right here. And I said, I need your help. I need to get to a doctor. And you know what he said? Oh, no, you don't need a doctor. You need the psychic. I got you to her. Mm. And he brought me to the woman who actually was the help we needed to navigate this illness. Oh. And she ha- she became, because my daughter's health journey, which has been, you know, she actually does have a genetic condition, which we did get diagnosed. Yeah, eventually, but, right? Eventually. But- it's also been a spiritual journey. Yeah. And that spiritual journey has needed the guidance of this psychic. Yeah. Wow. And and I've needed the guidance of this psychic. And there was all kinds of healing that needed to happen on a spiritual level that this initiated. Mm-hmm. So my father was there. 
my father got me not to the guy, but to the gal who knew just what we needed. Mm-hmm. And so, you can, uh, you continue to, to get guidance from him, don't you? Well, here's the thing. He's been so helpful to me financially. So we had, you know, we, he helped me sell a book, that book that I wrote with Fiona sold and it sold at an auction. And then it got optioned by Shonda Rhimes. And then I got to go to France and all kinds of things unfolded. And he helped me write this book. I always say he really, really helped me write it. We've been writing it together. And whenever I asked my dad, he was so not generous in life. I mean, he was so not generous and he is so generous from the other side. I think that's something that people are curious about, like how, you know, like, you, like your father's still swearing <laughs> from the other side, like he's still, still himself. he's still himself, but now trying to help. And I think that's something that people don't understand is that the unseen world is actually wanting to help us. My experience, and I don't know what yours has been, is that everyone on the other side wants to help, that part of what happens when we die, and you were talking about this with Tina, you know, we all leave a mess behind when we die. Yeah. Whether we know it or not. And there are a lot of things we do we don't even know we're doing that are messes, right? We all, we're all muddling, you know, as I often say, there are no saints in the land of the living, not even Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama. They're just human beings doing the best they can. And they leave messes behind. And we all do. And when we die, I think we can see those messes. I often say we can see the big picture. We yeah. get very shuttered in our lives. We we only see the short story of a single life. Mm-hmm. And we forget how long the story of life really is, how big, how generous. And so I think when we die... I think there's a moment when we realize, oh my gosh, what a mistake. I should have done this. I should have done that. If only I'd known. I mean, part of the reason I work with the dead, for instance, is I want to see with the eyes of the dead while I'm still alive. Hmm. I want to see what the dead see, which is how we're all intimately woven together, how our souls are connected to each other, Mm -hmm. how much there is. Mm -hmm. If we can really live inside of that that with the eyes of the dead i think we'd live very very differently than we do absolutely agree and i think that big picture you know is exactly what happens they're they're still the same per like they're them but they see so much that they didn't see before and they're like oh i didn't realize this was impacting her this way or oh maybe i mean it's almost like even a making amends kind of a thing kind of an energy as well 100% and it's one of, and it's one of the things i say the dead don't need healing we do and we need to collaborate with the dead to create the healing that we need my father was healed when he died i believe that do you know what i mean he got yep. to see the big picture but he also realized he kind of made a mess of things now you know, uh, he has some other messes I put him on to clean up too. And I don't with my siblings, but that's their business. And I want to tell their story, but right, you know, right. I've said, you know, unfortunately they don't know how to work with him directly. And so they don't know how much available he is for that. Um, mm-hmm. They did. Mm-hmm. They still see him as he was not as he can be now. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that of working with the unseen world. Let's talk because it's, I mean, it's the core thing that you teach and your own life experience. So remarkable. And you do say in the book though, that, um, you know, you don't recommend people go to psychics all the time because you want to really develop your connection, even though your connection didn't really start with the psychic, but it definitely took off that way. So Tell us about that, about developing Well, first this of all, people who are psychically gifted, um, I really honor them. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say that, um, you know, in ages past, we would have known how to treat these people. And now we, now we sort of dismiss them into the fringes of society. And they would have been people we were consulting about the future and about our lives and, and really honoring what they could do. And so I really, I know a lot of people who are, who have real psychic gifts. And I really am honored to be their friend and to know them. And I just want to say that. 
That said, everyone is psychic. Right. Everyone has access to right. psychic of knowing. It's just like anyone can sing. You don't want to go to the Met to listen to me, but I can sing a lullaby to my child. You know what right. I mean? Like right. I can, you know, right. <laughs> and, and and psychics are like the Met opera stars of, of, of the unseen world. And it's very, I think it's helpful to check in with a psychic. And like the, my experience was life-changing and I've had life-changing experiences with psychic. I had, you know, I, I had a, it's a long story I don't want to go into. Um, it's probably going to be my next book. But, you know, I had a, a medical experience that was very unexpected and very unpleasant that I couldn't find to figure out. And two different psychics gave me the information I needed to unlock a huge knot in my life. Mm. Essence had gotten knotted. Mm -hmm. And it was only because of the psychic information was I able to make sense of this experience and heal. So I love psychics. That said, I do believe and advise people, don't turn your own intuition over to somebody else. Right. You've got to develop your own intuition. Right. You have to, and even, and that goes with anybody who's working with you with the unseen world. Like if you go to a past life regressionist, it, if they say something and you go, oh, that resonates. Oh, that makes sense of things internally. Take it. If they say something, you go, what? Yeah. Then, then don't worry about it. I also do believe, and I really do think that the dead can work with anybody. So you can go to, you know, a psychic palm reader in a basement apartment in New York and your beloved dead can come through that person. Mm -hmm. If they get through to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So <laughs> I mean, I thought it happened to me. So, you know, I mean, I, the, the real challenge is to develop a daily relationship with those on the other side. And that's what I do. I begin my day, Francis, worrying because I worry. <laughs> and I, and Clark and I lie in bed and we drink our coffee and I worry. And then I turn over those worries to my friends on the other side. Mm -hmm. And some of those friends are ancestors and grandparents and parents and cousins and teachers. Some of them are saints. And I give everybody their assignments for the day. Give us an example of an assignment that you give for the day. And is it, do you, you give the, is it the same assignment every day or is it different on different days? Well, How do you do it? Pro I have long-term projects. <laughs> long-term plans. <laughs> long-term projects and short-term projects. Okay. Sometimes like today, I was trying to get my daughter a doctor's appointment because she has a lot of medical stuff still has to manage. And I couldn't get a human being on the phone. My father, all of the doctors in his building at the hospital had one secretary. Remember those days? One secretary to handle all the appointments, all yep. the incoming people and all the paperwork. She was amazing. And she would also babysit me and let me scribble on prescription pads. Her name <laughs> is Ruth Nelson. So sweet. And when I couldn't get anyone on the phone, I'd been on hold for 25 minutes. I remembered Ruth. I said, Ruth, get me a human being on the phone. And literally had the thought, and our human being answered the phone. Wow. That kind of to me all the time. And so, you know, there's a friction or a moment in life that's feeling hard. And I asked for help with the dead. My daughter recently moved um, into a wonderful new home and, you know, a very expansive, beautiful home. But moving is, as we know, exhausting and your life stressful. is in a box and stressful. And so she was, and she's been having a real flare up and of her autoimmune condition. And she was in a lot of pain that first night. And I was spending the night with her and I knew she couldn't fall asleep because she was in so much physical pain of uh, the condition. She, the genet, she has a genetic tissue collagen disorder, and it makes for a lot of physical pain. Um, and as I lay beside her in the darkness, I was just calling, going through my ancestors, like, Oh, who's going to help her? I was, I was thinking about all the doctors at the hospital, all the nurses, everybody. I'm saying all their names out loud. I think for some reason, I remembered this one doctor I don't think of very much. I didn't know her very well. Her name was Betty Gleason, and she and her husband, Sherm, were in a pediatric practice together. Sherm and Betty. And... <laughs> 
<laughs> he was the old fashioned pediatrician with a black bag, you know, and he would come to that house to check your tonsils. But she helped out the older kids. And actually, I only went to her once, which is she would do gynecological exams for girls in back in the 70s. And she was also, you had, she was very efficient, wore her little suits, had her little beauty parlor girls, right? Very efficient, but very non-judgmental. Mm. And you could hurt anything. And she'd give you information. Mm. And it was a really astounding experience. And I just suddenly remembered that. Betty Gleason, I don't ever think about Betty Gleason. I was thinking about Betty lying beside my daughter and I heard her exhale and fall asleep. Mm. Suddenly I realized, oh, Betty, you're a resource to help my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I went and I looked up her obituary and I started reading about her and her. she was apparently a great bird watcher and, you know, so suddenly she helped me in that moment. I want to get to know her. And now we're going to collaborate on another project together. Mm, fascinating. It's a relationship. It's not a transaction. Right, right. I, and I was, sort of, I was sort of surprised she was the person who showed up. But she did. And, you know, I'm always surprised by the dead, uh, you know, the house my daughter just moved into, I can tell these stories. I, every day I have these stories. Yeah. My day, every day generates these stories. It's hard to, it's hard to rent houses in our community. We are a very popular tourist destination. Right. We are like the number one Airbnb location in America. And so there are very few properties available for long-term rental. Right. And right. they're overpriced and they're scuzzy. <laughs> you know, it's just, but my daughter really wanted to find a place to rent. And we're looking at these houses and like each one seems like, you know, oh my God, was there a serial killer lived in this one before? <laughs> you know, you walk in the energy, you go, like, just get us out of here. <laughs> They're just horrible houses, They're all overpriced. And then we're looking at the cheapest house on the list we're looking at, we're like, oh gosh, I bet that's going to be awful. And we're headed down this road, we know. And suddenly we both look at each other we hadn't realized the address and we looked at each other and we both at the moment said, it's Leith's house. Mm. Leith was a young man in our community. His, he had a sister, a half sister, and her parents were killed in a car accident. Mm. And he stepped in as her guardian and he was only 26, 27. Mm. And he become her parent of a teenage girl. And he took this role, Francis, so seriously. Mm. And he had this home, he made a beautiful home. And not only that, he became a resource for all of the adolescents in our community. He was a kind of bridge between the grown up world and the teenage yeah. world. Yeah. He, you know, you can have some alcohol here, but I'm taking everybody's car keys, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, he right. was really. Right. He had his, and everybody came to him and he also would communicate with the parents. He was really terrific about that. And he was a great person. And, but his own life had been put on hold by this job. And when his sister was headed off to college, I remember he said to my daughter, now I get to date again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a few months later, he was diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer. Oh, goodness. And it was his house that we pulled up in front of. The house my daughter had spent her adolescence with him under his protection. Mm. It's this beautiful old farmhouse and the cheapest house. And not only that, a house where she felt safe as an yeah. adolescent. Yeah. And we knew he had got, she praised him every day. Mm. And so the first thing she did was put his picture out in the living room. So everyone would know this is Lee's house. Mm. This, the dead love us so much. They just want, yeah. and the thing is they're helping us with everything. Most of the time we don't even see it or know it. What becomes wonderful is when we know it. It's like when you saw the sign, it said, Christina, Christina, Christina. Yeah. They're there. Yeah. And when you think about God, you know, 
everybody you've known. Like I think about my second grade teacher and like all these people and it, it's specifically people that you've known, right? It's not necessarily, or can it be people that you don't know? Like I know we're recording this uh, in 2023 and we just had Sinead O'Connor pass and you know, so many amazing Pee Wee Herman, just amazing people have passed. I teach courses on the saints and what people used to know about the saints is that the saints weren't made by the church. The saints were made by the people who asked the dead for help. So Joan of Arc wasn't sainted by the church for 600 years, but for 600 years, people were calling on Joan for help. And yeah. Joan was showing up and answering their calls. People were devoted to her because she got the job done. Right. <laughs> she was a saint because the church couldn't deny it anymore. Right? right. Right. And that's the way saints happen is because people would call on the dead and the dead would help. And, and so you can feel a saint. I'll tell you one saint that I have is my, Elvis Presley probably died of the same genetic condition my daughter has, mm -hmm. which is a genetic collagen disorder, which creates heart problems, pain problems, GI problems. And it's probably why he was on so much pain medication. I mean, it's fascinating. Studies have been done on it. Anyway, I pray to Elvis for help with my daughter as health condition. And she, you know, particularly once she was having a lot of trouble and I prayed for help and she got through it effortlessly mm -hmm. and so now i pray to elvis every morning to protect my daughter from this the worst ravages of this illness wow and and sinead now i have a very personal relationship to her i mean like we all do every the people who feel a personal relationship to her we can't even describe it right there are people like this you go like I remember when I first heard her sing and I felt like she was singing my soul out of my mouth. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. like, and I loved her. Yeah. And I decided I made Sinead the patron saint from my book. I <gasps> that I Sinead helped me to be fearless <laughs> and honest and powerful, never deny who I am and be true to who I am and guide me in this process of bringing my book into the world and doing it in a way that I'm both successful and don't sell out. I love that so much. And I can feel the truth of that. Absolutely. Right? Fierce. Yeah. She's yeah. great. She's a great saint. And, and, you know, Marilyn Monroe, I mean, she's a saint, like Princess Diana. Princess you can Diana, feel. I know. Yeah. I pray to her every morning. I wrote a little prayer to her. Um, let me see. The people's princess, Diana, dear, to whom we turn when danger's near, protect our daughter, be her guide through landmines heartbreak at her side. Oh, so beautiful. Relieve her pain, return her love, nourish her body with sweetness thereof. Oh my I write prayers to my favorite saints and my favorite I ancestors. Love <laughs> I love that. That's so beautiful. I write, I love writing little silly prayers to the saints. And so the more my morning begins with saying all my favorite prayers to my saints. And so sweet. And I see right behind you, there's your altar of... There's the technically a wall. <laughs> yeah, it's like expanding. But that's it. And that's one of the ways that you teach, right? People can invite the dead to be in your home with you. Well, here's the thing. I, my teaching is really simple. The dead are real. Make a space for them in your lives. And collaborate with them. Yeah. And build your faith. Build yourself a foundation of faith through miracles. Mm -hmm. And... Everything else I do is an elaboration of that. I teach a lot of different workshops. They're all, in, but the way I say it is like, yeah, to make bread, all you have to do is take flour and water and mush it together and you can make bread. And people go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's what my classes are for, is helping people sort of remembering the last, lost art of collaborating with the dead in all the different ways that we can to grow miracles together. Beautiful. So tell us more about that. Um, how can people work with you if they want to work with you? Uh-huh. Well, they can go to my website, takebackthemagic.com. 
And there they'll find out about all of my different offerings for the year ahead. And I, and I offer a lot of different workshops, you know, and, and at, at a lot of different price points, I want to make this work as available to people as I can. So I have four week workshops and weekend workshops and six month workshops, and then year long intensives. My, my introductory workshops, I don't usually tend to cap enrollment. They tend to be bigger and less personal. My, and then I offer very intensive long-term workshops with very small enrollments where I can work very intensely with people. I also, cause I do want to get, have a sub stack. I have a free I was going to ask stack. you about that, about your sub stack, because your writing is so lovely. I mean, it's just so beautiful that, um, yeah. How, how can we find more about that? So go ahead, tell us. Take back the magic on Substack. And okay. this, and I have a free Substack and I usually try to write essay every week. My paid Substack um, allows me to work on upcoming books and write a little more personally. And it allows me just a layer of privacy. So and for ten dollars a month, you'll get three private essays, and 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 a in a real sneak peek behind the scenes at how I work on my next books. So I'm working on a book about the saints, and I'm working on a book about the mother, and so I'm really it's it's a lot of my writing in process. And I also offer for my paid sub stack of ten dollars a month a free uh, Zoom session to talk about the dead. Oh, nice. So that's, if, if you want, you know, for $10 a month, you yeah. can come and do read everything I'm saying about the dad and come and have a conversation with other people about the dad. And so that's sort of, that's amazing. And so I want to make everything, you know, I want to support myself as a working person in the world, but I also want to make everything I do available to people. Yeah, that's amazing to be able to ask because from my experience, as you open yourself up and you are having these conversations, you will have questions, you know, and to be able to show up with you once a month and be able to ask a question. That's amazing. Oh, they're fun. And the people who show up are so fun and they bring their, and so they're people who've been just reading about the work. And then there are people who've been doing it for three years of amazing stories. And it kind of, what it begins to do is it it shifts our belief sphere. We begin to realize when we hear other people's stories, how real this all is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, is there anything else you want to share with us or let us know? Cause I know we could talk forever, but I want to make sure we're that you're sharing everything you want to share. Um, just, I hope people will read the book. I hope that you'll come do a workshop. I hope you'll come meet me in Substack or, you know, at some other event. And, uh, but in any case, the dead will guide you. You can always just ask for help from the other side and they really will give it to you. Beautiful. So definitely order this book, my friends, order the book, take back the magic and um, really do yourself a favor do yourself a favor. It helps you not feel quite so lonely. That's what I think. Well, that's it. Finally, Francis, you don't feel alone anymore. I never feel alone. Mm -hmm. I always feel held. So beautiful. Oh, thank you so much, my friend. It's always so good to see you. And I'm so grateful for your time today and blessings of Sinead O'Connor on your book for sure. <laughs> All right, my friend. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Magnify Your Miracles podcast. As I said, definitely get this book. I will put all the notes in the um, in the show notes, the links for you for the Substack and for her website as well. And I encourage you to reach out to Brigitte if you can, if you want to find out more about her courses. They really are life changing. And I think with everything going on in the world right now, to not feel so alone in it and to know that no matter what's happening, it's going to be okay is so so valuable. If you have friends that you know would benefit from this amazing information, please share this episode with them. And as always, remember, my friend, that your miracle is already here. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Francis.